So here we are, and I should say something. I guess that's the expectation. Uh, we sent yesterday uh, with a group, we had 12 that came out for the shape training. Uh, and so we spent the day digging into uncovering our stories uh, and beginning to look at that and to have some tools to which they could assess uh, their life and begin to uh, dig into their abilities, their passions, their interests, uh, as well as the stories that have been unfolding since, uh, since the earliest of memories. And uh, so we had a great training yesterday, great conversation. Uh, as that wraps up, uh, the Bernans were having uh, the baby shower for Marissa here and was, had a chance to run into Bob uh, and caught up with him, hadn't seen him in a while, and uh, just sat and talked to him and caught up on life. And uh, he said he's, he's living over on the west side of Indy. And, um, and he, uh, he asked how things were going here, asked how the church was. He says, we've been to a number of churches and just can't find faith. Uh, he said, so he's like, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, if you can get one over to the West Side Indy, let me know. Um, I said, I don't see that happening soon, but maybe you want to plant a church, Bob. Uh, and he said, probably not. Um, the Drews are back, back from Florida. Yes, welcome home. Welcome home. So don't go to Florida again. You've learned their lesson. That's right. Grass isn't greener down there. It's sandier. Much, much sandier. <laughs> You guys went down there right before, kind of right before the hurricane, right as the hurricanes were coming on. Like, God was telling you, like, stay in Indiana, right? Huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> continuing with, uh, we've been talking about Advent Conspiracy, uh, which is something we've done for uh, at least the last five years. Uh, this posture that as we come into uh, Advent, which will happen on the, the first Sunday in December, and will continue up until the Christmas season, uh, Advent is this season of waiting in anticipation and in preparation for the celebration of the coming of the Christ child, the gift of the Christ child. Um, and, and since Christ has been on this earth and given us his mission, uh, the Advent that we celebrate now is the Advent of his return, the culmination of the kingdom, uh, the new heavens, the new earth that will be created and will be consummated uh, in that life. And so that's what we look forward to, that's what we hope for, uh, that's what we prepare for. And so in that, we sit in uh, the struggle, the pain that is life, um, but we use Advent Conspiracy as this uh, reminder to call us back to celebrating Christmas uh, in a way that, that reflects the honor that Christ deserves, one that is selfless, one that is generous, uh, one that is looking out for those who are uh, oppressed and forgotten and ignored in our culture. And so Advent Conspiracy calls us to put aside uh, the consumeristic mind approach that we often approach, that we hear around. I mean, commercials for Christmas are already flooding uh, the, the airwaves and the TV stations. It's unbelievable how much it's already out there. Um, and so this calls us back to a simpler way of celebrating the holiday. Uh, one that centers around four principles of spending less, giving more, loving all, and in doing that we get to worship fully what Christmas is actually all about. And so a couple weeks ago we talked about giving less, uh, and part of that is uh, the financial resources of that, um, but it's also recognizing that we can give less of our time, that we can make sure that we're spending uh, less time uh, in areas that we're not gifted, called, served to do ministry. Uh, which is hard for us because uh, as, as Christians, uh, particularly um, uh, within our culture, uh, we are called to serve, we're called to go, and so it, it's easy for us to stretch ourselves too far, too thin, uh, and not be able to say no in that regard. Um, but to give less, to know what you're able to give, and then to give less uh, of your time, not giving it out everywhere, but in focused increments to the places that matter most. To spend more. Spend more of your time uh, in the play and your resources in things that really matter and making a difference uh, in the lives of, of uh, those who could really use something. I had a chance this week to talk to Heinz as we were driving around uh, and we were talking about this concept and, uh, and I said, you know, what if we didn't do any, 
any gifts for Christmas, and what if we use that money to, um, to just give it all away? And uh, he said, there's a long silence, letting the weight of that sink in. He said, or, he said, that'd be good. He, he actually said, his first response was, that would be good. They could use it. Or, we could still celebrate Christmas, and then after, we could use our gifts to bless them. I thought, huh? Fair enough response. Um, but it was just a good conversation to see what that feels like, because it, it is. There is this joy in, in receiving of getting things that uh, you've looked at, that you've wanted, uh, and then the joy of giving, of being able to offer those gifts to others and that gift. And so, um, but doing it in a way that is simpler, that is giving of, of life and of situations that allow you to build that relationship. Uh, and so this, this week we're talking about the third, that third principle of loving all. And what does it look like to love all? Because that can sound just overwhelming. How do you love all? You turn on the TV station or you listen to the news and there's, there's a lot going on in the world uh, to care about uh, the, the worn, torn areas uh, of tribal warfare in Africa, to hear about, uh, again, the conflict that is constant in the Middle East, to hear about uh, the uh, political questions and discord within this own country, to the shooting Sunday at a church in Texas, to no doubt endless stories that you've heard closer to home as you've gone through your week. And all that, we hear this message to love others, and it easily becomes overwhelming that we kind of just hit the mute station, the mute button, and we say, I, I don't, it's so overwhelming, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to begin. So when we understand that we love all, uh, we understand that there are limitations to the love that we can offer. But however, there is a call that we have to be intentional in going out and doing that, that we don't get to leave that uh, for somebody else to do. Um, we don't get to put that off until a program gets organized, but that we go in this posture of having a loving mindset. And not in the sense of, uh, there are times that I have to love people where I don't feel like it, right? where the act may be there and the emotion may not. Uh, and that is the nature of Christ, of, of God loving in that agape feature that it's, you, you do it even though you don't feel like it because the goodness that you're offering, the kindness that you're offering, the generosity that you're offering is that which is needed. Uh, in the song we sang, as it opened up, it said, uh, love your sister, uh, even though she may have trespassed you. Uh, how, how's it go, John? Uh, what's the next line? Here, let me look over on your sheet. Uh, I'll get, what is it? Yes, if her trespass be real, if she's already stepped over the line, let her come further still. That further step is that step into reconciliation, into redemption. So when somebody has trespassed against you, and we say this every week, we say this every week because this is a prayer uh, that we constantly need to be reminded of because it's easy for us to become uh, so selfish and narrow in our approaches to life. And this prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray uh, says that we recognize that when somebody has done something against us, trespassed against us, uh, caused a debt against us, that they owe us or they've sinned against us. And so this song says when she's crossed the line, broken the boundary that was established, and she's already in your territory. So now let her come because the whole way brings her to a place of grace and redemption and reconciliation. See, the problem with loving all, ah, I'm falling apart here. Um, the problem with loving all is we allow our stories to hold us back. We're often afraid that if we give them a little bit, uh, they'll take advantage and go even further still. The prophet Jim Morrison said, people are afraid of themselves, of their own reality, of their feelings, most of all. People talk about how great love is, but that's baloney, because love hurts. Feelings are disturbing. People are taught that pain is evil and dangerous. And how can they deal with love if they're afraid to feel? For pain is meant to wake us up, 
Pain try, people try to hide their pain, but they're wrong in doing so, for pain is something to carry like a radio. You feel your strength in the experience of pain. It's all in how you carry it, and that's what matters. The pain is a feeling, and your feelings are a part of you. In your own reality, if you're ashamed of them, if you hide them, then you're allowing society to destroy your reality, and so you should stand up for your right to feel your pain. See, initially when pain happens, it pushes us to a place of darkness in our life. And when we step into darkness, we step into isolation. We move away from people. We move away from relationships. We move away uh, from community. We move away from even being able to hear that which is true or that which we believe or have faith in. And so we create an arm's distance, if not further, away from the pain in order to isolate us. If there's one reality in this life that we all share, the reality is that each of us has stories of pain that have shaped us. In fact, it's our stories of pain that shape us more than our stories of goodness or of blessing or of hope. If you want to know somebody's story, if you want to ask somebody, tell me about your story, they usually are, are going to start from the, pain, the stories of pain and of hurt and of disappointment that they've experienced from others around them. And it's through those stories, it's through navigating those, that they begin to see the blessings a little more clearly, to see hope a little brighter. Paul talks about this. We heard this uh, from one of the speakers uh, in Wichita this past fall. Uh, she talked about Paul's thorn. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians where he says, I have received wonderful revelations from God but to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Now, he's not talking an actual thorn that he got from a rose bush or a cactus or whatever. He's talking about this hindrance, this disturbance, this thing that is, has kept him off. He says, so I've given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. We echo Paul's thought. We have something that is this, a thorn, a, a splinter that gets stuck into our soul, into our being. And when we get that, we say, why? Why, God, do I have this? Why has Satan put this upon me? And Paul does the same thing. He says, this has come from Satan to torment me, to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times, he continues, I beg the Lord to take it away. And each time, he said, my grace is all you need, that my power works best in your weakness. So now, Paul says, so now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me and I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and in the hardships and the persecution and the troubles that I suffer for Christ for when I am weak, he is strong. Paul starts and he says, I've gotten this thorn and Satan gave it to me. And I prayed to God and I said, God, release this thorn from my flesh. And he hears from God this revelation, my grace is sufficient. And Paul, his perspective, his theology changes in verse 8. His theology changes and he says, and now I realize that I have to be a steward of my pain. steward of my pain, that I am responsible for managing the hardships of my life. I don't get to become victim to this thorn. I don't get to say, oh, woe is me. Oh, Satan has got me under his thumb. Oh, God is out to get me. Paul says, no, 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 no. God's grace is sufficient. And so now I must be a steward of my pain. This pain, this thorn has the ability to reveal the kingdom of God in my life to others. See, oftentimes we take the stories of our pain and we allow shame to hide them. We don't talk about them. They stay closed off. We, we bury them deep within us, deep within the reality that if we meet a new person in life, a new season, they may never hear those stories. They may never come to know 
those experiences depending on the level of intimacy we have with them. Kurt Thompson in his book, The Shame of the Soul, says that we are storytellers and we yearn to tell and hear stories of goodness and beauty. And this is the echo of God's intention. For we long for our stories to be about joy, not just reflections of what we believe, but who we are, we long to be. But shame, shame wants very much to infect every element of our mind in order to distort that story and offer another narrative. The defining relational motive for humankind is not that we need to work as hard as we can, or at least harder than we are. It's not to do our best or to guarantee that our children will have a better life than we had. It is not about being right or to have the acquisition of power. Each of those and other versions like these play into the hand of shame's anxiety. No, rather we are created for joy. Not a weak, watery concept of joy that merely dilutes our sadness and our pain. Rather it's the hard deck on which all of life finds its legs. A byproduct of deeply connected relationships that each member is constantly known. And while we realize this and we hear this, for some reason we forget this so easily. This slips from our mind, and the moment the next episode of pain comes in, we begin to create these narratives in our head of shame. Well, nobody can know this of me because they'll think less of me. That they'll think that I was weak, that they'll think that I did something wrong, they'll think that my faith is not what I hope or wish it could be. And so in that, we move deeper into the recesses of darkness of our life, allowing that narrative to shape us. And yet when we read through the scripture, we see this story being played out time and time and time again. It happened with Jacob and Esau. Jacob has this deception that he deceives his brother from his birthright. He runs away to start his life anew towards the end of his life. He comes back to meet Esau. Esau has sent word to him and said, come home, brother, which is also the same word as repent. Come home. And Jacob is so nervous that he sends this entourage. He sends gifts and people and all of his people out before him. He's like, I'm going to put all you out in front of me. So that hopefully Esau will be impressed. Hopefully he'll receive the gifts. I can kind of buy him some favor because I've stolen so much from him. And then he sends everybody across and Jacob stays on one side of the river. And there in the night, an angel of the Lord visits him, and he wrestles with him. We know the story. Wrestles him till daybreak, and the angel of the Lord says, I must go. And he says, not until you give me a blessing. Jacob stays on that side, not because he's pondering this great reunion. He is stuck on this side of life in fear and shame. And it's come back and caught up with him. And the angel breaks his hip so that he can get free and gives him the blessing of a new name, which is Israel, the house of my people. Which declares and names and gives an identity to the people from there on out. That my people will be people who choose and make mistakes and use deception and they will run away and they will continue with And then they will come home, and when they come home, they will be broken and will be given a new name and identity through their shame. Redemption, reconciliation. Let him come further still. We see it in other stories. We see it in Matthew 6 as Jesus crosses the the ocean with the disciples and the storm comes upon them and they cry out, Jesus, don't you care about us? And he wakes up. And he calms the storm. He says, where's your faith? Where's your faith that can withstand the storm? Stop praying for storms to subside in your life, and I'm asking you to increase your faith so that it can withstand the storm. That's the faith I'm calling you into. That's the faith I need my disciples to have. To step into the storm. Reggie McNeil says that he wants, that that God is calling the church to be this band of disciples that is willing to storm the gates of hell with their water guns. That we become these roaring lambs that we're as meek and gentle and soft, yet have this message that just blows people's hair back, not in this fierce, coercive way, but just in this compelling passion of love that meets people in their shame, 
that as we hide into the darkness and step into the darkness and allow it to shroud us, which the psalmist calls out and says, even darkness cannot hide you. And we hide in the shame, and the place of the believer is to come into those dark places and to reach out and to grab their hand and say, I'm here with you. We love the story. We see the story in Hollywood. We see the story, one of my favorite movies, What Dreams May Come, the story of this woman who, who commits suicide because of her, her entire family has lost. It's the story of Job. Her f- entire family has been killed. She sinks into this depression. She takes her own life and puts her into the lowest place of hell. And there, her husband, in the afterlife, says, I will go to the depths of hell to rescue my wife. They said, if you go to that place, you will forget who you were and you will re- never return to life. And he said, I'll make that journey. I'll set aside my security. I'll set aside the salvation that I have received in order for the sake to meet the pain and the agony of my wife. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That we're not so secure in our ivory castle of salvation that we call out to the rest of this world from the safe, secure place, come and get it! But that we leave the castle and we go out into the world and we say, there's a better way to live. Come with me. Walk with me. Join me. And so when we love all, we love the people who are directly around us. When Jesus speaks of mustard seeds, when he talks about having a faith that moves mountain, he's talking about a practical way that when we meet people in our lives, at work, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, we're giving them practical action of love that steps into their shame. Now, the story of people's shame takes time. Very few people are walking around with their lives and their hearts gaping open, allowing you to see the stories of their shame. That's why you go to Facebook, because we all post it there, so you can easily see it there. (laughs) But we don't openly expose that. And so it takes time to get to that place, to hear that story, to hear that cry, to hear that which is there. And as Jim Morrison says, it's in that that we get to celebrate and really see life. Because life has come through the pain, it has come through the disappointment, it has come through the failures. That's where we actually get shaped into who we are and who God is calling us to be. So we can become stewards of not only our own pain, but we become the stewards of other people's pain. We can help them to have the skills and the tasks and the fellowship, and the community, and the resources of of prayer, and of lament, of calling out to God, of of allowing themselves to to be angry with the way things are, because this isn't the way it's supposed to be, and God says, yeah, I know, I know, tell me about it. I watch my own son, my own gift to the world, sent to him, not to condemn the world, but to love the world, to redeem the world, to save the world. And they still killed him. They still hung him on a cross. They still rejected the gift. Shame wants to alter our stories by telling its own warped vision. One that usually brings trouble wherever it goes. We have a chance to love all by sharing in a new message and a new hope. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this fresh wind that Christ has offered us, that the Spirit has taught and led us to understand. God, we thank thank you for people like Paul who had thorns in their life, who became stewards of their pain. They didn't allow shame uh, to warp their story, to cloud their judgment, to keep them from living into the true self that you've created them to be. So God, the invitation is there before us that we get to go out into the world. These people that step into the darkness with those who are already there and we get to take them by the hand and lead them out 
from the confines and the shackles of their shame. And yes, that's dirty, and yes, it's ugly, and yes, it's slow, and yes, it will cause us pain as we make that journey. But we want your grace to shine through our weakness. I trust that your gospel writes a better story than the shame has already written. And that in that, we can come in contact with a life that is both good and beautiful, not only for ourselves, but for the relationships that we sit in. May God be with you as you head into your week. May you become stewards of pain, owning the darkness at which you have been led through throughout your life so that you may go back into the darkness of others' lives and lead them to the place of light and life. May God be with you. Go in God's peace.